I got my PhD from the Stockholm Royal Institute of Technology and finished my postdoctoral work at the University of Bern in Switzerland in 2015. I won't go into detail, but my work centred around electromagnetic disruption and practical electromedical application. Chances are that if you check Google Scholar for these keywords, my name will pop up as a co-author on at least one of the top five results. However, in early December of 2016, I was in an accident. I was staying overnight for a conference in Copenhagen, where a colleague of mine had rented a large apartment. However, due to an electrical error, there was heat buildup in the main water heater, causing a steam explosion. I was sleeping pretty much wall to wall with it. My face and shoulders took the main brunt of the boiling water, steam, and pressure. The last thing I remember seeing was a bright light, followed by a sudden and complete dark. I had to go through evisceration and a nucleation of both eyes. I lost eight teeth on the right side of my face and most of my nose. At least 20% of the body fat in my right arm was burned off. The reconstructive surgery on my face took a team of surgeons 18 hours. This was followed by months of just trying to survive, moving back in with my family and going through cosmetic surgery, mainly for my face. To this day, I still have no idea what was said at the conference. After a few months, I was fitted for double eye prosthetics. It took a total of three months before I was even given the option to start therapy. I'm not gonna lie. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Most people who are legally blind can still perceive some kind of light, but complete blindness, about 7% of us, is one step further. One day I could be suicidal, and the next day I was determined to learn braille. Because of the damage to my eyelids, the surgeons opted to connect my new tear ducts to my nose, so crying just made my nose runny. Three years later, I was in a much better state of mind. Although sudden blindness isn't something you can really ever adapt to, I was doing better. I still wasn't ready to go out on my own, but with a friend or family member just to help me along, I could go pretty far. I also learned to appreciate all those weird accessibility options that come with most computers. You have no idea. In autumn of 2019, I was contacted by a man who told me he represented a group associated with renewable energy research. Living in Sweden, renewable energy is a big deal, and it is something I've personally been interested in. In fact, it was going to be the subject of my next article, just before the accident. The man offered me a job. He told me that he worked at a lab with disabled scientists, and that my expertise was in high demand. The pay was more than generous, and, as a benefit package, I would be given a personal assistant. Pay off for an off-site two-bedroom apartment was also a part of the benefits. I agreed to have an interview. The man who was going to interview me was clearly from another country, but he was ready to fly out to meet me at short notice. He came to visit the very next day. We had a private conversation at my parents' house. He asked a lot of questions about my work, and I could hear him tapping away at a touchscreen. We discussed some of the details, but there was one thing he consciously seemed to avoid, where the main lab was located. He seemed uncomfortable talking about it, but he promised that I would be given a private flight whenever I wanted during the downtime, off-site. There would be four weeks of work on-site, living in the apartment outside the main lab, followed by two weeks off-site, kind of like paid vacation. I would be on rotating shifts with one morning, midday, evening, and night shift. The weirdest thing was revealed, just as I was about to accept the offer. Every single scientist at the main lab was completely blind. I accepted the offer. The next week, I was picked up by the same man, let's call him Samuel, and taken to a private flight. I still had no idea where we were going, but other passengers were speaking in an Asian language. Indonesian, I think. On the flight, I was introduced to my personal assistant, Mila. I think she was Australian. Mila was a darling. She knew exactly what to say and when to help me, but most importantly, she knew when to give me space. It was as if she could read discomfort on my, albeit reconstructed, face and just acted on it immediately. She must have had a lot of experience working with the visually impaired. My first few days were mostly orientation and introductions. 
I would be working with a team of two other scientists and seven assistants. Two each, one general. Apparently, our personal assistants would not be available while in the lab, but they would be on call as soon as we went off site. They would also help us with cooking, cleaning, whatever we wanted. It was a big operation. A total of 40 people just in the main building, all completely blind. At least a hundred others. With the pay we were getting and the benefits, this was a very expensive project. We're talking millions, possible tens of millions. My team would be working with material research. As Samuel explained, they were developing a new type of material as part of renewable energy tech. They weren't completely clear on the possible end result, but the metal we would be testing was told to be unique, extremely valuable, and uncomfortably bright. Apparently, it could cause blindness during prolonged exposure, which was the main reason they put together a team of blind scientists. During my first day at the facility, I was given plenty of time to adapt. The other members of my team were just as new as I was, but we were given radio instructions how to move through the various corridors. There was a decontamination room without protective suits, and we were told to follow guiding pipes along the walls. On the left were cold pipes, on the right were warm, three pipes on each side, leading to a total of six rooms. The pipes had square, circle and triangle engravings, making it easier for us to find our main room. We were team Warm Triangle. The work itself wasn't that bad, mostly just repetitive. The test object was isolated in a separate room, but we could check it through samples, material exposures and readings. We were all given separate workstations and hearing equipment so we could isolate the sounds of our specific assistants, and just to make sure our computer equipment wouldn't read over one another. We had buttons on our headsets to adjust who could listen in, and to mute certain sounds. It took a lot of time to adapt to it. There were at least 50 codes to memorise. I got to know my assistants fairly well. There was Aaron, an American, and Holger, a Norwegian. They were both older than me, and both had master's degrees. They were quick to follow directions, and equally quick to offer suggestions. I could tell they were having some authority issues, but they didn't make it a problem, and the first three week-long shifts were fine. We went from midday to evening to night. The night shift was, of course, the toughest. By now, I was getting to know the place and routine. I had noticed a few things during my testing, but also just from the context of what was being talked about in the facility. The seventh assistant would come down with lunches for us, and we ate in a small common room, warm circle, where we would talk more freely about what we learned. We never changed from warm triangle as our main room, even when we changed shifts. The whole setup was weird. The material was extremely reflective. From the way it was tested, it seemed rectangular in shape and thin. My colleagues talked about it possibly being similar to a pane of glass. The material had several strange properties. It would absorb light, but dissipated it almost instantly. It would, to some degree, also absorb electric energy, low-level radiation, and radio waves. I had never seen anything like it, if you pardon the expression. By chance, we also discovered a peculiar feature. The object, by now called the pain, briefly absorbed sound waves and would reflect it back after a few seconds. Like a delayed echo, but slightly distorted. Kind of like it had been run through an underwater filter, bouncing between sheets of metal. If I said hello, I would hear a clear, but lower, hello right back after about eight seconds. This being, despite me standing no less than ten feet away from the object, it made no sense. Once during the night shift, Holger fell ill. It wasn't bad, just a light case of pneumonia, but the company had a zero tolerance policy for sickness in the workplace. He got the week off at his apartment, and I had to work with one less assistant. It delayed my progress somewhat, but Aaron was eager to make up for lost time. Too eager, it turns out. On the second to last day of the night shift, Aaron accidentally caused a power outage. We were pressure testing the object when Aaron slipped and knocked over some volatile materials at another workstation. Nothing happened, explosion-wise, but the entire room went into immediate lockdown and the power was shut off. The doors shut and locked from the outside. 
I didn't notice the lights go out, but I could feel the room quickly growing cold. It occurred to me that the object was probably absorbing the warmth, and there was no climate control to compensate anymore. Then, something weird happened. We were all sitting quietly, our headsets being turned off, and waited for the power to come back on. That's when... I heard something. Hello. It was the same off-putting, distorted voice that I thought was a delayed echo. One of my colleagues, Gertrude, responded with a, Hello? Right back. I heard four quick footsteps, like the start of a drum roll, and something slamming into the glass, separating us from the object. Something squishy. Hello. Now, we stayed quiet. The footsteps came in quick bursts, pacing back and forth, looking for weaknesses in the glass. We usually used small airlocks to put in samples to test. We had two airlocks, and the leftmost one of these was a tarped. I could hear something rattling the airlock, trying to rip it loose. Hello. I could hear the grinding sound of metal being bent. I pressed myself against the wall, holding my breath. The power came back on with a vengeance. My headphones were full of people screaming. Evacuation protocol initiated. Proceed to... Get out! Get the fuck out! Warm triangle! Respond immediately! I repeat! Half the voices were in a foreign language. We ran for the door. I didn't need to follow the pipes to get back to the decontamination room. But only then did I notice we were one person short. We'd lost Gertrude. Once outside, we were separated and isolated. Standing outside in freezing temperatures, I was stripped naked. Several people, all screaming in a foreign language, lifted my arms and legs and checked me from my feet all the way to my hair. I was forced into a plastic tent, forced my mouth open, and checked my teeth. My ears were cleaned with some sort of antiseptic, and my eye prosthetics were discarded completely. It was quick, violent, and terrifying. I was locked inside my apartment for the rest of the night. Mila came around to help me, but she told me she was instructed not to talk about my work under any circumstances. That's when I first suspected that my apartment was bugged. I spent a week in that apartment with daily checkups. I felt fine, but the entire ordeal was stressing me out. Having my head shaved was uncomfortable, and I was scared they might find something they wouldn't like. After that one week, I was suddenly told that it was necessary to terminate my position. I didn't recognise the voice of the man telling me this. I was given four months of full pay, an apology, a non-disclosure agreement, and an immediate flight back home. Mila was holding back tears, trying to help me park. She seemed frightened. I've been home ever since. But I come to you to share my story. I've been doing my best to stay financially independent. But life hasn't been treating me well. I'm still having stress reactions. And there has been a recent development that I don't know how to deal with. Last night, I was brushing my teeth. And the power went out. I could hear the air conditioning and dryer suddenly go quiet. And the entire room felt colder. Except for the bathroom mirror, which radiated a slight heat. I stretched my hand out to touch it. This might be hard to understand for someone who doesn't think about their sense of touch too often, but I've touched that mirror for every night for years on end by now. I know exactly where my hand was in the space of the room, and there was no mirror where my hand was. Still, I touched it. Every part of my finger touched something extruding from the mirror's surface. Something with rounded edges. Then, it made a sound. Hello.